I am going to begin uh, recording and it uh, looks kind of a small crew here today, but um, that is just fine. We're happy to have you all here as we begin the new year. Um, I wanna open up here uh, with some pictures that Helen Hep had just sent this morning. Um, and I'm hoping that there's somebody here online that can explain this seeding activity that occurred apparently just over the weekend on Saturday. Cindy, I know you're online, so perhaps you can share what's going on in these uh, in this this these little mini terrariums apparently. Oh, so so this is a a winter seed sowing uh, technique uh, that we talked about in study group several years ago, and then we practiced it last year for the gar in the in the demonstration garden um, and and grew a lot of little seedlings for the for the food bank clients right and so we just tried it again this year we had more people and Helen and Jude and other folks brought tons of milk jugs um, so we had lots to work with and we had lots of seeds so we just planted until we got I saw almost 100 milk jugs right there is what it is um, so what you do is you split it in half you, you cut it in half and leave like a hinge at the at the handle a, a, a little strap of the of, of top and bottom of the milk jug attached at the at the at the handle and you poke holes in the bottom put about four inches of soil in find a cool season crop uh, that you want to get started outside and then you know, uh, plant seeds make sure the soil's moist and then uh, kind of tape it up and then write whatever it is on the jug and it's it's good if you could also put a, a label inside as well because the you know the writing on the on the outside of the jug is not going to last with most of the pins that we use, so um, and then you just leave it with a with a with a lid off. You leave it uh, to catch rain and just uh, deal with the elements on its own. So it's a way to you to get some seeds started without uh, uh, without taking any room away from the greenhouse seeds incredibly Absolutely. clever now when the seeds start when they germinate is uh -huh. it fairly easy to dig in and pull mm -hmm. the um you know the the seed out yeah so so that's exactly what so that's right this is all we're going to use this for is for for getting germination to happen and hopefully to get to those seedlings far enough along that we can just go ahead and transplant them into larger pots so very cool very cool. Has anybody else on the call, you know, used this technique or seen this technique before? It's new to me. Hi, Jude. I have. No, but I will definitely try it. <laughs> I have. It's called winter sowing. Very cool. Very cool. And you've had success with it, Margie. Um, yes, we had a study group about two years ago, and I think there's a PowerPoint out there that tells a little bit more about how to do it. Well, very impressive. So I just, you know, so thank you all for sharing. Thank you. Thank Helen for sharing the pictures, by the way. And uh, keep stuff like that coming, right? You know, having these pictures and so forth is always fun. And it's a great way to kick off these uh, uh, these calls here. So well, it uh, was a really sunny day. So it was a, a wonderful day to be doing that. We we were just lucky to have a good day to, to actually get out and do it. You know, that's a good comment. I mean, look at that blue sky and the sun behind you. So what wonderful. A, I mean, give <laughs> Given the contrast to what we've been having for the last few weeks, this is indeed significant. <laughs> okay, so we're into 2022. Happy New Year to everybody. And at uh, the National Garden Bureau, of course, has announced their plants of the year. And it, uh, it looks like Peperomia. And that's the first thing I want to say. I've never heard of Peperomia. So it, uh, is, this a, is this a common plant to others? It, uh, and do, they, do you have it in your gardens? Because apparently many of these peperonia are epiphytes. And that, They're uh, indoor plants here in the Pacific Northwest for all the nurseries I've ever worked in. Really? I've, I've never seen them grown outdoors. Very cool. And, it, uh, and it, but apparently they, uh, as, as the reading I have, the notes I have here is that they, they, mo they grow mostly as an, in an understory in the tropics and they don't need much light. So ex to your point, Rhonda, they said it, it says that they make perfect houseplants. So we also have salad greens as the uh, as the as the vegetable of the year here. <laughs> so we have salad greens. We have gladiolus as a bulb and some pretty pictures there. 
and verbena and some great shots of the different flowering of verbena and it uh, and apparently the comments i have here in the notes that these are actually very good for uh, uh, for hot and at uh, dry weather and i guess there's something like 800 species of um of verbena that's out there phlox is out there as a wildflower and it um apparently this is this is a an easy to this they, they talk about wildflowers that um stretch all the way from florida all the way to quebec and i'll even even unto alaska so one of the earliest north american natives to be cultivated as a plant so you know why all of these are plants of the year these are all plants of the year they they, they do different type you know they have a bulb they have a vegetable they have a you know perennial oh so the national garden and by the way there's a whole array if you go to the website for the national garden bureau a phenomenal uh, 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 photo gallery of all these uh, photos of all these pictures with some his history and background of the plants too, by the way. So it is interesting. So these are all brightly colored things to it to uh, hopefully lead to a brightly colored year. I wanted to, unfortunately, however, um, introduce, come into the meeting here this morning with some very sad news about the loss of Ron. And it, uh, he passed uh, recently, and it, uh, we definitely have um, uh, in, in, uh, the address to where condolences can be sent is to his daughter there in Milwaukee. And I believe that's, uh, that's Milwaukee, Washington, yeah. Um, no, sorry, it's Wisconsin. Oh, okay, well, that's interesting. So that's, yeah, so there's, there's an error there. So it sorry. does. So let's just make sure that's a whisk. I, I noticed the ad, yeah, the zip code seems to be quite, uh, quite off here. So that's Milwaukee, Wisconsin, please, W-I. So that's Melissa Sharnan. Kathleen, any other comments with respect to Ron and his passing and mem uh, memoriams? Well, um... You're back on mute, Kathleen. Yeah, it just seems that he was uh, so committed to the, so devoted and committed to the master gardeners that uh, the family would like to uh, donate his uh, equipment, all his gardening equipment to to the master gardeners, et cetera. So uh, it was a big part of his life, it seems. Hmm. So it um, it's um, it's indeed it was, and it uh, and of course he, he's he, he's he's always been a tried and true you know um, uh, supporter, and it, um, and eagerly engaged. So I was I was shocked to learn of his passing, and it um, and it uh, and indeed it will be a, it's a loss to our foundation and a loss to the program overall. So one one thing that we haven't mentioned about Ron is that he actually was the the garden uh, the demon, the Elba demonstration garden. Um, chair for a while, for several years. In fact, I think Rick said that it was about the time that he came into Master Gardeners that that um, Rick was doing, uh, no, I'm sorry, that, that Ron was doing, uh, overseeing the, the demonstration garden in Elma. So, I mean, so he's had a long history of working on, on pretty exciting things in, in Master Gardeners, so. When, when did Ron die? Kathleen, when did he pass? Early last week, it appears. Yeah. And, and Kathleen, can you send out the uh, address for condolences uh, by email or something? Because I can, don't see it anywhere. It's on the bottom of the screen, if you can see that. I'm looking at the screen and I don't. Of the picture, look at the photograph. I'm looking at the photo of Ron, and there's no address on mine. So okay, it's at it's at the bottom, and it. Uh, but we can. What, can you? Can someone put that in the chat? Then that'd be great. Yeah, I'll yeah, put that'd it in be the, great. I'll put it in the chat. And uh, apologies if anyone sees the address at the bottom of Ron's photo. It should say Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So uh, yes. I'll put it in the within the next minute. I will put it in the chat. 
And I just want to say for, for North Beach, we'll miss him terribly. Uh, I just saw him at the uh, recognition uh, party and uh, bought some honey from him. And he, he was in really good spirits. And we always love to have him out here at North Beach doing a uh, with the kids at the library or in the garden, the, the bee uh, lectures, and he'd always bring all of his samples and he was a lovely person. We'll miss him. Rhonda, Sabine, you both have your hands up. Yeah, uh, I've, been, I've been having mine up since we were talking about plants of 2022. So I'm backtracking here. I wanted to share with you, and I don't know if you can see this, a friend in Germany gave me a calendar and it says the growing calendar and you open it. And I don't know if you've ever seen that. I had not. Every month shows it's, it's the, the days of the month and it features a forgotten seed. For January, it is the strawberry spinach and you turn it over and there's a seed band and you just take this page, plant it. And then you have spinach, uh, strawberry <laughs> spinach. And every Wonderful. month, a different, a different uh, plant is featured. And again, it's a plant that, you know, has not been used or people don't even remember exists. And I'm very psyched to start planting my, my strawberry spirit, uh, spinach real quickly. And I thought this would make a great uh, cool. present. Calendar. We can make it ourselves, you know, and give it to friends. We can buy seed tape and just make a calendar. That is cool. Thank you. I was just going to comment the same that uh, Ron was at the recognition luncheon and he sat next to me and we had a great conversation through that uh, recognition ceremony and he was in great spirits and cheerful as always, epitome of health. I would have never have known that he was uh, suffering or potentially at a point in his life where he was not gonna be with us anymore really saddens me. Any other remembrances? Just because it he really is a, just a great guy. I mean, just a fun guy to be around, you know. Sorry, I just joined late. What happened to Ron? <laughs> well, we lost him. <laughs> so oh. the, so he's, he's no longer with us. And it just it's a very sad, you know, it's a very sad uh, passing because it, uh, it was very sudden, as Kathleen has shared just last week, at least sudden to us. And it uh, um, but as you see on the screen there is that condolences can be sent to his daughter there in Wisconsin. That's Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it, um, and it, um, uh, you know, if that's, uh, it's, um, and again, it just really was a sad, uh, sad time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's just one other comment. I, and I think maybe Mary's on call. She can confirm this. I think Ron was actually foundation president at one time too. Mary, um, I, I don't remember that, but. Okay, he may not have been, but I think, I thought he told me once that he had been. Oh. There's but no he, question. He was very active and very active in all of our administration. So I just, you know, so it just, it, it truly is a loss to the program in general and very much a loss to the foundation. Um, so one other, one other thing though, Kelly, about uh, what, what really struck me about Ron is he, he was way ahead of the rest of us on, on uh, the importance of uh, native insects. And he did, I, granted, these are na not native insects he's working with here in, in this picture, but the, the mason bees, but he was way ahead of most of us on, on understanding what an important thing to protect and to provide them with habitat. So, and that was a message that I'm sure he shared with the kids in ocean shores when, when he was out there doing his bee things or anyways, uh, he certainly did that often enough showing us how to make mason bee um, uh, nesting sites and such. So anyway, that was really impressive for me and, and kind of turned my world around on that, so. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, I just, just, go ahead. I have a comment that uh, not only all of us miss him, but uh, I'm sure millions of bees are going to miss him. I just wanna know what's happening with his hives. Um. Yeah, I can tell you that. Um, his daughter, Melissa, uh, took care of it and contacted the uh, local beekeepers who were part of his bee organization. And um, they were, uh, they've got a good new home. Oh, good, wonderful. Yeah. 
that, that would be something to lose uh, that would be impactful. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to share uh, too, he, You've gone on mute there. We're not hearing it, okay. Kathleen. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can hear you fine. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Vivian, <laughs> Vivian organized a big uh, Girl Scout activity on Mother's Day. Uh, Scouts of all ages were there, and uh, Ron uh, and Jerry Fernia and some other people uh, presented at that. At that, and Ron taught about mason bees and the importance of bees and pollinators, and the kids from you know, age six or seven up were just uh, enthralled the whole time and had a great time making the Mason Bee uh, homes. And uh, also just wanted to mention Ron uh, died outside uh, while he was working on his tractor. So his daughter said that was uh, the best, you know, he had a quick and peaceful death and uh, it was the place he wanted to be. So he had a good death. So it's truly going to be a sad loss, and I would encourage you. I, I can I can appreciate that um, I, that Ron's daughters would probably also appreciate stories or any sharing, uh, because they obviously they live they live quite a ways away in the Midwest. I mean, anything we can do to help um, share our memories of Ron would probably be comforting to uh, Melissa uh, um, and the family there. So it, uh, it, uh, I, would encourage, I would encourage you to send a card, send a note. Okay. So as we kick on, was it, we have a number of things to talk about through today, quite a could bit I, of- uh, Could I say something, Kelly? Oh, please, yeah, please, Rick. Yeah, I just got in here and uh, um, um, I knew Ron since about 2006, about when he took over the uh, demonstration garden for several years there and was in charge and uh, we had a long relationship through the years here and uh, with uh, him working in the yard there and his beds and his uh, worm boxes. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, when his uh, daughter was here in 2014 with their, his grandkids, they found my two cats that I have at home here when they were just barely little suffering little kittens on almost dead on the walkway there. And his daughter cleaned their eyes out and the kids brought the kittens in and I brought the kittens home in a bucket here and my kittens are right here in the bed with me right now. So uh, I've had a long relationship with Ron and his worms out there and uh, uh, truly miss him. That is a great story. That's so a thank great you. story. Thank you for letting me say something here because we had a long relationship here and I'm glad that uh, he did not have to suffer or anything like that. So Thank again, you. you know, send a card, send a note to Melissa. Um, yes, I will. I got the, the her phone number here and her address here on the, uh, uh, wherever I saw it here on the email this morning. And yeah. Kathleen, thank you so very much, by the way, for capturing this information and sharing. Yeah, um, you're welcome. And I, I apologize. The, uh, the address is Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, not Washington. 53222 is the zip code. Um, Kelly, I'd like to suggest that maybe we have a repository for some photos. I've just pulled up two of Ron in the demonstration garden in Elma that we might be able to uh, share with the family. Boy, that would be great. And it, uh, it, it, there's, there's probably a ways, and, and by the way, I'd be happy to collect any photos if you have, and we can at least package those. It'd be great to share some of those um, in an upcoming e-news as well. Okay, I'll send some right away to you. Very good, thank you. Um, Kelly, I don't know if it's um, appropriate for me to ask, but how, why, how did he die? Kathleen, you said he passed away on, on his tractor outside quickly. Uh he was working on his tractor and uh, uh, the, thought from, the thought was it was a cardiac c condition. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. Very good. So moving on, a number of things to talk about through today. 
Um, we have a number of announcements at, um, um, and a lot of updates happening because it's a, it's a new year and we're all off to the races here. Um, uh, we'll be joined here sh shortly uh, by Dr. David Giblin from uh, UW, um, whom I'm particularly excited that we have here today. Um, uh, David Giblin is the, at, um, uh, the, the, the curator of the herbarium at the Burke Museum at UW, and he was the lead editor on the second edition of the Hitchcock Flora of the Pacific Northwest. So um, uh, uh, in which uh, I think I've made this point in the, um, in the E! News, I mean, 42% of all the species in that original uh, 1973 publication have been reclassified uh, based now that we have uh, DNA. Uh, and other, you know, uh, and other just uh, resorting of botanical uh, tax taxonomies. So it, um, I'm especially, in, uh, uh, David is very familiar with the area here, by the way, and it uh, does a lot of collecting down in Grace Harbor in Pacific County. So it, uh, we're very privileged to have um, uh, him with us um, here today. So birthdays. Well, Cindy, you know, happy birthday to you. And Bev and Garnet, who I know are on, happy birthday to you for January birthdays here. Um, I also wanted to make note in terms of birthdays, of course, that the 17th next Monday is the study group that Sabine has, has noted, uh, and it'll be via Zoom. The meeting ID is there and also published in the e-news. So that'll be at 1 p.m. You know, via Zoom next Monday. So what a great way to get a kickoff to your continuing education hours for 2022. Okay. Also, a quick reminder on behalf of uh, Lena and, uh, um, and, uh, and Brenda, it's time to recommit and to remember ourselves here. So if you've not yet completed and submitted your, your 2022, uh, you know, recommitment forms and uh, sign up forms to the program, to the WSU program, and to the foundation, please do so. Because uh, we certainly, it, uh, it certainly, it's time to get uh, a new um, um, uh, roster pulled together of uh, all members who are prepared to commit themselves for another year of volunteer service. Quick reminder of January to do's from uh, courtesy of um, Oregon State. Time to begin our 2022 garden journal, right? And to think about having a soil tested as you move forward here. Um, of course, there's always a reminder, this is the time, even if we can't be outside in our garment, our gardens, it's a great time to be working on our tools and making sure that, uh, that, you know, that uh, they have been taken care of, as opposed to many of our tools, my tools, the Bev's and my tools here that end up getting left outside and, at, uh, and quite rusty <laughs> over the course of the season. Okay, a uh, couple of reminders uh, that both WSU and Oregon State have uh, 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 notices out about where to send your soils for testing. And it, um, uh, the, uh, I found that the, uh, the OSU, um, uh, the um, uh, publication there is actually far more helpful uh, for uh, home gardeners as opposed to the, uh, the WSU lab list, uh, which is uh, very much aimed of course towards farms and, at, um, and large agricultural operations. Um, house plants, and it, uh, this is a, a big notice here is that uh, obviously we're still, you know, this, so much of our time is so much of our time now in gardening is indoor and it um there's an interesting time to be thinking about um you know just uh, you know not just dusting our houses but also dusting the leaves dusting the foliage on the plants and making sure that we're protecting them from drafts and it uh, and for other um you know and other uh, uh insect festations that may be coming in so Reminder quickly is that as we enter into 2022, we our board is indeed composited by our president, PJ, who's with us, and our president-elect, Sabine, who's with us. We have a vice president, secretary, treasurer, state reps, you know, uh, John, Margie, Cindy, and Terry, Robin, and Rhonda on public events. And then, of course, at, uh, for North Beach and Pacific County, the individual, you know, support supporters there. Okay. And it, uh, I'm going to ask Louise there to mute herself if I can get to it here. Okay. And if you would, just everybody, a quick reminder, of course, it's just always good to mute themselves if they're at, uh, if you're not actually actively speaking here. Okay. 
What's he doing? Making a margarita or something? <laughs> just, <laughs> just, that was, that was, that was, I think that was a Christmas. Uh, uh, well, I, I won't, uh, I won't go, I won't go there. But uh, a quick shout out here to 2022 and it uh, and the fact that this is a great time for us all to be thinking about where we want to volunteer and where we want to spend time in the, uh, in the year here, uh, in the year outreach. And it, um, uh, John, Margie, Terry, and Cindy would all appreciate all of your support as we move into the new year. And it, uh, be, please be thinking about um, you know, where you can best make your contribution um, because as, as a public service organization, right? You know, it is huge. We, we all depend upon volunteers and it's, it's so very important that we're all there. So to that point, reminder as a foundation, right? You know, we are here as a foundation to continue the education and the sharing of information to the communities in Grays Harbor and Pacific counties. We do fundraise. We do fundraise, and as a nonprofit, then it's important that we raise money to support our programs. And we'll be talking about budgets and activities here in a few little in a, in a little bit, along with course activities to get together and to learn. So with that, uh, we we enter uh, 2022, of course, with our faculty liaison Tony, and our two coordinators Alina and Brenda. And so this is it's great to be back up to two coordinators because it um, you know given the 3,500 square miles that our foundation covers being able to have that amount of support is pretty darn significant. So announcements I wanted to kick off with is it, um, and give Cindy some time here to talk about training. I have two slides here um, uh, that talk about training update that Cindy has, has, has helped prepare. Um, Cindy, the floor is yours, please take it. How about that? Uh, so, as you can see, we've got orientation plan for February 19th. That's about uh, two weeks before training actually starts. So um, we don't have a location. We've kind of decided that it's either gonna be uh, at the fairgrounds or it's gonna be Montesano Library, but we ha I, haven't, I haven't nailed that one down yet. And the time is gonna be from 10 to one o'clock. Orientation is for trainees. And, and the folks that are putting the training on. So it's not really an open invitation to, to all folks on the, on the um, Zoom today, but just, just to let you know that that is, you know, a, it's a step towards uh, actual training. So we have to get folks, um, the, the trainees uh, oriented before we actually jump into training, which is gonna start on March the 5th. So currently we don't have any updates on the number of applicants, so maybe, Brenda can tell us about that in a little bit. Um, we, we talked a little bit about that in our executive committee meeting. We don't usually have good numbers on uh, applicants until, gosh, until right about the deadline. I, I guess we like to, <laughs> I guess we like an exciting life, <laughs> something to worry about. But uh, okay, in the session facilitators, we've all, we've all, I assume we've all put, put forth a, a a classroom that we have um, set aside for our for our topics. Um, there are the two classes that are going to be held in Pacific County are Kelly's, which is Woody Plants and Pruning, and Sharon Coolish Bales, who does uh, vegetables and fruit, small fruit gardening. So it's kind of uh, that's they're both really uh, well sought after and and much desired classes to attend. Um, but I think you guys are going to have them at the Lutheran Church in South Bend. Is that the is that the intent right now? Correct. And I've secured that for our first one on our on, uh, on April 2nd. Okay, perfect. And so and then one of the things to think about is that is that uh, in, in these sites is that is that there's going to be room for the trainees and the people who are presenting. There's not always going to be room for for uh, veteran master gardeners, but we, but I, I wanted to extend an uh, an invite to ma uh, veteran master gardeners to come to some of our training sessions, and I'll let you know which ones. If you feel like you want to earn a little CE, or if there's a special presenter there, or a special topic you want to just refresh yourself with, it's an easy way to get CE. Um, but, anyways, that's that's for. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, 
So we are adding new information to our sessions to make sure that they're up to date. Um, a, good, a good example of that is the soils. We're talking not just about physical soil properties. We're now going to be talking about the biological soil properties as well, which is, um, as some of you probably are aware, is, is it a very exciting and very, um, uh, it's, a, it's a game changer for how gardening can, can uh, support climate uh, stability or so but so that's that's part of what we're talking about in in soils um, as far as the mentors uh, gosh Holly Holly Seifert is is heading that up with the with the oversight of Garnet uh, and the mentors are the folks from the class of 2020 which is really nice it's a great way to do it to have the folks that who are closest to the training to talk about or help the new trainees through it. And, and their job is basically to, to help, uh, to provide a little bit of moral support and to help with some of the, some of the information online, you know, and how to, how to navigate that. Uh, they're not going to be taking the role of the, of the coordinators. That's not, that's not the point. What the mentors are there to do is more to provide a, a friendly face when somebody feels like they're they they need a little bit of support, and they're sometimes trainees are not um, they don't they may not feel like like they can approach a master gardener. I you know I think back to when you went through master gardener training. It it can be intimidating. So but th to have the trainees from the last time be there for for the new trainees to kind of guide them through and let them know that we are friendly and we do want you to succeed, all that. So that's what the mentor program is, is about. I kind of got it in a nutshell. I'm sure you could do a much better job of explaining. And anyway, then the first session is gonna start on the 5th of March and it will be about botany. That's nothing new on that one. So, so any, any kind of questions on that? probably heard enough on it huh so any questions here's the full schedule you know that begins in march 5th and continues through july and as it um, as cindy indicated right you know is it uh, obviously the, the attendance is primarily focused on the on the, uh, the on the on the on the trainees um but there is a great opportunity here to pick up um you know pick up some um, um continuing education if indeed is appropriate john you have your hand raised yes i was uh, told by another person in the uh, training that there's only a handful of students. Is that true? Yes, at this point in time, that's all we know of, but that doesn't, that's not the limit. If you, anybody who's been through a session of training planning knows that it's, you, you never know who, how many people are gonna be there until, until after the deadline. And when's the deadline? Oh, it's coming up. Oh, it's coming up on Saturday, uh, the deadline to apply. Um, where that's why Mary just put out a push to Karen, Karen Young to send out uh, information on and, and to kind of remind us, it, it's on the Master Gardener uh, Facebook and also Instagram, I hope, uh, to, to remind us that this is their, our, last, our last opportunity to, uh, to apply for this year's training. Uh, but what we, what we also want you to do is if you have an Instagram or a Facebook uh, account that you maybe, you maybe share that with people in your account as well, not just, you know, so it doesn't just go to people who are, are um, directly linked to the Master Gardener Facebook page or reach out to them. So that would help us out if you would reach out to, if you know somebody in your, in your neighborhood or your friends that want to also take Master Gardener training or they've mentioned that you might just, you might just want to call them and let them know that the de deadline's coming up and they, if, if they're interested, they need to get their application in by Saturday. Okay. Other questions, uh, comments for Cindy? Yes, uh, Cindy, this is uh, Rick. Hi, Rick. Uh, um, Katie where I and I were on uh, KEBKW yesterday with Johnny Manson for a solid hour. We talked about training off and on for that whole hour. Yay. And, uh, Thank uh, you. We're, uh, after this meeting is over, I'm going to run over to uh, Kyle Pauly at uh, KXRO and try to get on uh, sometime the rest of this week uh, 
talk about it one more time. Thank you. If, if uh, we can get on, uh, we'll try. Thank and, you, Rick. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you, Rick. And, and Mary's also submitted a, an article to the newspapers recently. So, so, there's, so there's more PR that's coming out this week, but it, but it is our last week before the deadline. So it's time to do something. And uh, Midge is posting on the chat, right, that she's posted the training notice to the, on the Westport, uh, Westport Facebook page, along with Connie. Thank you, Midge. Thank you, Connie. We're getting the word out there. And of course, you know, you got to admit, it's just, it's, it's tough given COVID, right? You know, getting promotion out and making, uh, connecting with people. So yes. it, uh, it's a big deal. You know, I wonder if it's a good opportunity to remind everybody that uh, WSU has just adjusted their their masking requirements, right? Uh, I think we've just gotten notice that uh, uh, cloth masks, regular cloth masks are going to be unsatisfactory. We need to have medical style, medical grade mask mm -hmm. or, uh, of course, N95s. Okay. Yep. Good point. Now, another activity going on, of course, is, that, uh, is the bylaws. Uh, and we have a bylaws committee being led by PJ and Sabine uh, and going after the, uh, the full, um, going after the, you know, our bylaws, which, you know, have been a while, you know, which need, need to, you know, need to be at, um, need to be scrubbed. Um, so at um, uh, PJ, any comments with respect to your team and that, uh, and the process and progress that you're making here? So um, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, bylaws is not a sexy committee. If you've missed the chance and want to be a part of that, this initial review, please let me know. Refuel or replenish from any side. That's why you can see the tower, the tower down there. I've done calls in all manner of places for the last 30 years. They have to be done, especially for nonprofits. Okay. And uh, there are some new rules in the state of Washington, so, uh, which I'm going to try to get to the committee. Or was it like a hub and a spoke? Are we okay? Coal Tower, you know, was the main hub of you know, all the activity. Oh, yeah, the bridge is uh, trying to find we get some other folks here trying to mute, mute some other folks here so we can get uh, get them in here okay and um so i'm really thankful for the committee we also have Gre gary fredericks from the state foundation committee who's going to serve as our mentor to just go over things before we bring it to the membership uh, i want everybody to understand we are reviewing them editing them, getting them up to snuff, having Gary's guidance, and then they come to you, the membership. And the first reading is really um, just a, a day to have a lot of caffeine as you listen, because we will literally read the bylaws and then people have a chance to, to bring up points that they think that we've missed or maybe need to be covered. Um, and then the second and third reading that have to happen are not as intense as the first one. And then they'll be good for the year. And then hopefully, because we'll have done such an in-depth time this year, hopefully, uh, next year's review, because they are supposed to be reviewed every year, will be an easier piece to do. But um, very grateful for the people that have stepped forward to be on the committee. Not too late to sign up if you'd like to. Won't involve tons of meetings, mainly readings and editings, and then we'll make changes. And we're, it may be ambitious. We're hoping to bring the first set in April or May to the membership. So stay tuned for a fun event when we go through our bylaws together and bring them up to snuff. So just a shout out in support of the committee, you know, while it may not be sexy, going through this kind of exercise can be very helpful to um, not just uh, it can be very helpful for your own edification. And if you're involved in any other nonprofits, you know, who might benefit from having a, a more robust bylaws for that right. organization, this could be an opportunity just to learn something and to, to, and to build some confidence in terms of what at, uh, what a good set of bylaws should look like for a nonprofit organization. Right. Okay, thank you, PJ. Thanks, Kelly. So quick heads up on some dates, of course. Reminder that our 2022 Home and Garden Show, we're keeping our fingers crossed. We're hoping we'll be able to make it happen. May 14th and 15th with two setup days on the 12th and the 13th. Um, uh, 
Robin, Terry, Rhonda, any comments and perspectives you want to share now for everybody? Well, I sent out the um, invitations um, for um, the home side a week ago, I guess, almost a week ago. And I've gotten 15 responses back that they want to be in the show. I had That's one the garden side. The garden side, 15 for me. <laughs> Yesterday, a guy called me, Rhonda, and I, I couldn't I couldn't figure out who he was and he kept saying I was there last time on the 29th on the 19th or 2019 and I kept saying I just don't recognize your name I'm sorry you know and then finally he said oh I was on the home side I'm like oh that's why I don't recognize your name so I sent him to you thank you I finally got all my invites sent out last week and yesterday I had five contact me back one that's very interested in our big premium site taking four <clears throat> booths Oh, I'll be talking with her today about the details of it. And the other three are just thrilled that we're going forward and told me about some of the other events that they've been to in the past two months that were successful versus not successful. And um, they're excited. So I think we're going to have a good show this year. Let's keep our I fingers do. crossed. I too. The 15 that got back to me are like gung ho, like, yay, yeah. we're doing this. We're ready, you know. So. And I did send out 82 invites. That's how many that I have on my list. And if anybody in our organization has a company or a idea of a company that might be involved, please let me know or send me anything that you have. Um, <clears throat> We're always looking for more and different. The location of the home and garden show is the Elma Fairgrounds. Somebody just asked. Yeah, right here in Elma. And Rick, um, this would be something uh, the next time you're on the radio that we are um, looking for vendors for the home and garden show. It would be great if you could, but maybe. Uh, at least mention it. Yeah, that's a good idea. So uh, several um, master gardeners have um, contacted me with with um, new vendors, and I've called them, and they have signed up. So that's good. Always Very good. Fun. So with respect to all of us as volunteers here, make sure these dates are on our calendars so that we're setting aside the time to, to support here. This is, a, as we all know, this takes a lot of volunteer effort to pull off, but it's a big deal. And just as Robin, Rhonda, and Terry have indicated, it's a big deal for the vendors that participate here, especially after the years now of um, not being able to come out and, it, uh, and present, their, present their wares and their products. So this could be a really big deal this year. So we're all looking forward to it. Other dates to keep on tap for this year include the Garden Tour in July on July 23rd, July 23rd for the Garden Tour. And it, um, 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 Terry, you want to pick it up? I know you're still looking for gardens. Oh, are we looking for gardens? Um, if you have spotted any, any garden that looks interesting, um, I would love to hear um, where it is. You don't have to contact anybody. Um, we'll take care of, of um, looking into um, whether or not it's that we have to follow up on. We're just looking for clearly in the um, greater area, Aberdeenshire, Central Park, um, kind of um, feeling that the area for there's got to be one wonderful gardens there somewhere. So if you please, please uh, send those leads. So a reminder then from Terry that, uh, you know, is it uh, anything in the greater Aberdeen area? The other, I, yeah. Go ahead, Terry. Yes, and, and also, uh, as part of uh, the garden tour, we have our plant sale. So if you are starting to work out and editing um, plants in your garden, please please consider putting up some more plant sale because that's always a good way for us to generate some money. So again, this is a great, it is a great opportunity to be thinking about the starts you're making now for plants that ideally would be flowering or in full foliage come mid-summer, 
uh, because this is a big deal. In fact, as we're going to see in the budget, uh, in a big, it, it is a big deal, and it's a big expectation from a uh, from a money from a money standpoint. But again, just to recap what Terry's saying, if you spy a garden in the greater Aberdeen, Hoquiam area that you think would be a candidate, right, for a showcase, just give Terry a note, and it uh, and she'll do the heavy lifting of reaching out. And of course, other dates, so, you know, uh, go ahead. Kelly, uh, this is Rick again. We were on the radio yesterday and uh, we did mention the Home and Garden Show and the Garden Tour. And uh, of do we told them to contact the Pacific Northwest Master Gardener website, you know, and notify somebody and leave it a uh, message there. So I don't know exactly what we should say on the air as far as who to contact. Um, because we'll mention it again on the radio station because we're going on again next month. And uh, um, so should it be to you directly, uh, Terry? And I think the answer well, is yes. It can start with me. It'll, okay. <laughs> it'll, it'll get shared with, um, with Rhonda and, and, and Robin as well. Uh, so anyone else who's interested, because at some point we'll probably have committee meeting if we are allowed to uh, meet again. But you know, so they, can they send it to their website also uh, um, and you'll get that message or uh, should it be directly to you personally? Do you want people calling your house? Yes, yes. Because we, because I can uh, give out, because I can give out your number. You <laughs> to know. go through the Sorry. website. The website? Okay. Yeah. So let's okay. go through the website as a preferred path. Yeah, That's what I hear you saying, Terry. The website. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And of course, not to diminish yes. the fact that we've got demo gardens and demo beds across our two county area. So, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to just Cindy, to Bev, to, uh, to Brenda and to, um, and to Shashila for activities happening in all the areas across the beds uh, on the years here. And a quick, uh, interesting article here that uh, that uh, that um, uh, Mary Shane saved, uh, by the way, that I really want to make sure that uh, is is posted out here, is that um, is a great article in the Garden uh, Guardian talking about um, a peat bogs, and it um, and activities happening here. And so it's it's pretty exciting that uh, how we are rediscovering ecosystems that have been um, long exploited uh, and perhaps abused, you know, by uh, by human interactions. But the uh, um, uh, but we're understanding so much about these that uh, these ecosystems now. So it, uh, again, just a shout out uh, to Mary for sharing this article. I would don't try to uh, uh, copy down the uh, the URL, which is extensive here. Just do a search on the Guardian for that uh, for Scotland peat, Scotland's peat bogs, and it uh, and check these out. Quick reminder uh, on behalf of Alina and Brenda here to get your hours recorded. We're into a new year. We do have an obligation then to get those hours, both the volunteer hours and the continuing education hours recorded. Of course, the uh, the Give Pulse system uh, doesn't have the easiest user interface as we've all discussed over the past year. But I would hope by this time that we're all got some facilitation of using it. And of course, we recognize that this is the system that, uh, that we need to have an official record. And so again, the clock starts now in January with the new hours, both continuing ed and volunteers. So this is the time to start racking up those hours because we need them. Okay. And a quick reminder also then of, it, um, of where your shopping can help our foundation. Reminder that uh, Amazon has a process in which smile.amazon.com can be, you can direct 0.5% of your purchases towards a charity of your choice. Doesn't have to be ours, but I mean, this is, it's an easy way to, uh, to let Jeff Bezos, you know, share a little bit of his, uh, his wealth uh, with the charity of your choice. Fred Meyer does the same thing. And I would imagine, I know Safeway has a, has a similar program. So it, uh, it certainly deserves checking in terms of where you shop, how you can maximize any contribution, any charitable benefit of your natural shopping. Uh, that would benefit uh, charity of your choice. A quick shout out then to, again, to Sharon uh, coolidge Bales as well as to Renee for their tireless work on keeping our uh, finances uh, tracking. Um, the 2021 income statement, the full record of what all happened in all of last year is prepared. 
um, uh, you know, it's pretty cool. We only suffered a, you know, a net loss of nearly $3,000 when we had budgeted much higher than that. You can see that the garden tour brought in almost, uh, you know, over $6,300 and plant sales, look at that, over $5,600 from plant sales. So as Terry was noting um, last no, a few slides ago, the impact of, of uh, plants that we start nurturing now and sell at the home and garden show and at the tour make big deal. It's a big deal in terms of the, uh, the financial impact, uh, the positive financial impact. So again, kudos for everybody who's uh, contributed in making um, last year a success in that uh, you know, our, our loss of $3,000 was only a loss of $3,000 in this COVID year. And it, um, that maps then to our balance sheet. And you can see we are still cash strong, cash strong with the, uh, over $54,000 in, um, in, um, in cash, uh, cash receipts. So we are doing well, very well in weathering the pandemic relative to the financial, uh, the financial exigencies that it's placing on many other organizations. And as we look ahead to this year, to 2022, the budget request that have been put in by all the committees is shared here. And this is a proposed budget that we'll be reviewing in the board meeting following today's foundation meeting. And you all are welcome to stay on and, uh, and join us for the board meeting. We, budget our, we are budgeting a net loss of over $5,700 this year. But all of this has everything to do with being able to uh, with being able to manage, um, you know, with being able to manage um, our expenses and being able to maximize the income. You can see that we're planning on that home and garden show. That home and garden show is a big money maker for us. The garden tour we have modest expectations for, and plant sales we also have modest expectations for. So we definitely have every expectation of exceeding these major income uh, producing activities. And it, uh, so that we can use these funds to invest in our workshops, our demo gardens, our clinics, and our other education programs. So again, a shout out to Renee and Sharon for their work. And, it, uh, and this is very genuine uh, in, in, uh, in appreciation for the work you do in, uh, in keeping um, our financials uh, transparent, accurate, and up to date. Any comments from anybody, by the way, with respect to 2021 or 2022 budgets? Again, we'll be talking about this in the, in the foundation meeting and the Board, formal board meeting coming up shortly after the meeting today. Okay. So a quick shout out to next month's program speaker, Tassie to give. Tassie to give will be at, uh, you know, will be at, uh, will be joining us here today. And it uh, will be joining us here uh, on the 8th of February, excuse me. And it, um, uh, Tassie is with Glass Wing out of Seattle. And she actually gives a program, she actually gives a webinar program routinely on houseplants and how to manage houseplants. And the dialogue that I've had with Tassie is in the concept of that we as master gardeners for WSU spend a lot of time outdoors and a lot of time in our outdoor gardens and our outdoor, outdoor horticulture. And at, uh, at, um, WSU doesn't spend much time with us in terms of educating us in terms of houseplants. And so at, um, very much looking forward to this February Zoom next month uh, about houseplants and how to take care of houseplants. So shout out to um, uh, Tassie and shout out to Glass Wing in Seattle uh, for their sponsorship of this. And with this, this is our transition here to, uh, to, to David, who has joined us here today. Because uh, I'm especially excited uh, to, uh, I'm going to turn the screen on the, over here to David uh, for his own uh, self-introduction and for his own discussion here. But I, I definitely want to make a, a shout out to, um, uh, to the work that he has done on this seminal, seminal book, which I would, I would I'd, I'd invite everyone to use chat to indicate if they have a copy of the original Hitchcock and Cronquist Flora or if they've already purchased their new second edition, uh, which I have here. Um, I mean, it's an investment, but I tell you, it is a worthy reference that will be around uh, for, you know, for the duration of your, of your career in, it, uh, in, it, uh, in, plant, uh, in, in loving plants and identification of plants. Um, we are very, uh, uh, very grateful for David's participation here today. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share here today so that, uh, um, so that David has a chance to share, you know, whatever the materials he wants to share and to give an introduction. 
David, it's over to you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Can you all hear me? We can. Okay, yes. so I just pasted into the chat. Um, let me see. I want to send it to everybody. I pasted into the chat a URL for my presentation today. In the event you want to share it with somebody, it's it's not terribly complicated, but I I find it. Uh, is helpful. So you should be able to copy and paste that or click on that link and it should download a PDF of the presentation. And I want to thank Kelly for the invitation to be with you today and thank you all for coming to listen. I'm really flattered and honored to be uh, presenting what we do here with you all. I do presentations with various Master Gardener groups. I think of Pierce County, San Juan's, I think there's one other one that I've done, maybe Thurston, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's a great organization. And the work that you all do is, is really important and valuable. So um, thank you for your, your time and service and promotion of plants <laughs> in, in all their forms. So with that, I am going to um, let me just switch my slide here. Okay. I'm going to share screen this and I think I'm, I'm not going to make it complicated. I'm going to, hopefully you can see that. Indeed we do. All right. And then you should see the full screen there. So the title of my talk is Revising Floor of the Pacific Northwest. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, the blue version of it, this is what it looks like. This is what the new one looks like. That's actually a cover. Uh, the, the hard uh, cover is actually blue as well, but it's the, the inside looks a little different. Anyway, this is the, what it looks like if you see it online or get to a bookstore. And so I just wanna give you an overview of the presentation. I'm going to talk initially about the herbarium in general here at the University of Washington's Burke Museum, and then I will go over, uh, provide an overview of how we went about revising the flora and why we felt like that work was necessary. And then again, there's the URL for today's presentation. So a little bit of background history of the, of the herbarium. The herbarium was started in 1879 by a group called the Young Naturalist Society here in Seattle. And in our most basic sense of what our mission is, we document taxonomic diversity and the distribution of species through dried specimens. And we store those in perpetuity here and we make those specimens and the data associated with them available to researchers and amateurs as well worldwide. Um, but the specimens we loan to researchers at other institutions. And so we have, we do that for, for five organismal groups. Um, we have about 700,000, over 700,000 labeled and archived plant, fungus, and algal specimens that date back to the 18th, uh, mid 19th century. So we really have a library, if you will, or an encyclopedia of the diversity of these organisms here in the Northwest dating back over 150 years. We're the largest herbarium in the Northwest. Uh, we're certainly one of the most active. We have a really small operating budget. I was listening to your, your finances. Boy, can we trade? I get $7,500 a year to run the herbarium. I've got 12 people working for me. So that means I spend a lot of time raising funding, raising funding externally. And we've been successful in that effort. We've raised about $4 million through a variety of sources uh, federal grants, uh, contracts, philanthropy. So uh, we've raised quite a bit of money over the last 15 years to support our efforts here. And so I'm just going to focus, you know, real quickly on what the herbarium looks like if you were to come here. The specimens are stored in steel cabinets. We've got about 250 of them. If you open up any one of those doors, they all look the same inside. They've got folders. If you open up the folders inside, you will find mounted and pressed specimens. They're all 11 by 17 inches and they share three things. They have an accession number, 
uh, towards the upper right hand corner, there's the physical specimen itself, and then there's a label to go with it. And we need all of those things. Um, if you look closely at today's label, which is much more information rich than when they started in the 1850s, um, there's the scientific name, there's the person who did the identification, the name of uh, where they got the book, the location information, latitude and longitude, elevation, associated species, and then maybe some comments about the plant. So it's really information rich, uh, the specimens. And just to give you an idea of um, where I go uh, or where I have been in the course of my time. I've been here almost 20 years. I've been all across Washington and as far east as Montana, as far south as, as Nevada. But most of my work is here in Washington. And I'll just say this, the flora changes, it is dynamic. And the only way we capture those changes, whether it's through human activities or natural processes is by collecting. And that's why uh, my uh, plot here is really um, far and wide. And I can, will continue going forward to fill in uh, those gaps. One of the gaps I'm filling in, I started a project this past summer called the 50 Peaks Project to survey 50 uh, alpine summits in the Cascades from the Goat Rocks up to the Canadian border. I'm doing that with undergraduate students. So it's a great field exercise and, and science training experience for them. And, you know, we get to go to some neat places. It, you know, it looks nice when we get up here, but you didn't see the, the mosquitoes and the and the weights we had on our back and the wind and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, we're learning a lot of interesting things about the plants that are growing up there and expanding the range of rare species and, and, and other things. So this is super and it'll serve as baseline data against which future climate change impacts can be compared. Another thing I'm involved with, uh, my colleagues and I, the Consortium of the Pacific Northwest Herbaria. So for the last 15 years, we've been databasing and imaging specimens at over 40 herbaria throughout the Pacific Northwest. We now have over three point, nearly three point, actually this, I did this uh, a few weeks ago. We have over 3.1 million specimens and uh, nearly 1.5 specimen images. And so users of this database enter a scientific name and up come all of the records associated with that name. So as you can imagine, someone like me who's interested in species distributions, being able to visualize where things are, when they occur. We have images associated with the specimen so we can verify the identification. So this is a huge effort supported by the National Science Foundation and it is ongoing. A resource that I think you all would be particularly interested in if you don't know about it already is our Plants and Fungi of Washington Image Gallery. We have, and actually what this is what I'm gonna do. I didn't wanna to try to do anything um, too complicated, but I would like to do a live demo of that database if I can. Um, I think I'm, uh, shoot, let me, let me try this one more time. I'm wondering if, I clicked the wrong thing. So here's our Plants of Washington Image Gallery. And uh, we have nearly 80,000 photos of native and introduced wild growing plants here in Washington. Um, you can search on a variety of ways. You can search on common name, scientific name, um, and, and family, things like that. And you know, I'll leave you to navigate around here, but one of the things that is also we've been working on is an illustrated glossary of botanical terms. And so if I click on here, there are some terms maybe you're familiar with, abaxial, which is the underside of a leaf surface. You can click on a name and there are photos that illustrate those concepts. So uh, this is super. I think it's a great learning uh, tool. And as I say, the way that, uh, there are over 3,000 species on the website. And for each species, there's a distribution map based on the specimens that I mentioned earlier. There's folk, um, close ups of flowers, growth habit, uh, information about habitat, bloom period, whether it's native or introduced, whether it's rare or not. And then there's a whole bunch of other images there. 
uh, that support the species. And then one last thing we have that you might be interested in is an, a, a very easy to use plant identification key. So I can say, uh, let's see if I can get that ribes back. Uh, it's a shrub, it's perennial, it's got alternate leaves. They were simple. The flower color was greenish. I'm gonna say it was in, it was a forest understory species. I actually didn't see, uh, I'm gonna say it's native and you can see it's updating it the whole time here. I'm down to 14 matches. I hit show matches and then up come all of the species that have, and there's our Ribes bracteosum that we were just looking at. So I would encourage you um, to you know, explore that. And I think you will find that that's a really neat resource. Okay, so back to my presentation. And again, I, one of the reasons why I made this available is so, because I can't, uh, I can't do a live demo in a PowerPoint presentation, but what I just showed you here um, is captured here in the slides. So there's a species page for a delphinium and there's the additional um, species uh, images and then there's the identification key. So we thought, wow, this is such a great resource. Why don't we make it available on your phone where you don't have to have an internet connection. So several years ago, we released Washington Wildflowers, which is a smartphone app that has that very same key um, right here on your phone. And it relies on you know flower color, time of year, what part of the state you're in. And then it gives you back a list of choices. And then you click on one and it's got uh, a species page focused to that. So. It's available, it is $9.99, and it's not like um, anybody's getting rich here. It's really popular. I think we've sold over 5,000 units because it is such a great resource for helping identify common native and introduced species here in Washington. Um, of course, what we worked on mostly, uh, actually all those things that I just showed you served as the basis for creating floor of the Pacific Northwest, which will be um, the part that I will end with here, and just an overview of, of that effort. And I need to acknowledge my colleagues on the project, going from left to right, that's Ben Legler, who he's got about 10,000 images in the image gallery, and he's the person who developed, did the web programming to develop that resource. Uh, he's now at the University of Wyoming. In the center is my colleague, Peter Zika, who is an uh, extraordinary botanist, and then my boss and herbarium curator, Dick Olmsted, uh, on the right there. And so it was, we're the four editors, although uh, as you'll see, we had a lot of help in producing the book. So just a reminder what the book is, it is a one volume technical field identification manual for plants of the Pacific Northwest, essentially going from Eugene up to Vancouver Island, Southern British Columbia, east to Western Montana, and South in Idaho, to the area north of the Snake River. And so um, just, a, you know, whether or not you consider that the Northwest, okay, uh, that's what Hitchcock and Cronquist delineated as. And they produce this wonderful book, one volume, fully illustrated, and it has the species descriptions that are used uh, as part of the keys. And this is a really novel idea that amazingly nobody else is that I'm aware of has reproduced which is surprising because it, it really works so well. I came here as a graduate student in 1995. It's one of the first books I bought. I thought, oh, this is awesome. I came back to my current position in 2002 and I thought, wow, this is awesome, but I'm starting to see some holes in it. And I went to my boss and said, hey, uh, I think we should update this. And the timing just wasn't right. And so it was another 10 years after I started here that we actually got around to. We started in 2013. And so you might want to say, well, it's such a great book. Why would it need a revision? And the reality is we've generated a lot of information since 1973. Um, we have documented 25% additional species, subspecies, and varieties. The collective term for that is taxa here in the Northwest. So Hitchcock and Cronquist in their first volume had about 4,200 taxa. We documented 5,300. 40% of the names of that book had been changed and 40% of the generic keys 
needed to be modified for a variety of reasons. So it was nearly 50% outdated. And so that's why we updated it. And just to point out some of the things that were not in that first edition, uh, for whatever reason, I'm never quite sure. English Holly isn't included there. I don't know what it's like down in your part of the state. This is all over the place up here. So obviously we need a flora that includes all of uh, the species, including the widespread introduced species. There's also a lot of species that have been described since 1973. Origeron siliciae in the 80s. Uh, Castilea victoriae was uh, in the 2000s. Erodium, uh, Eriogonum codium over on the Hanfer uh, Reserve, I think is the late 80s, early 90s. And then this is a hybrid impatience, which was described in the early 2000s. So we've added a lot of new species to the flora. So we need a book that when you go out, you can actually identify everything that you may see. More importantly, a lot of our common wildflowers have gone under a lot of name changes. So you might know this as Trientalis or Trientalis. It's now in the genus Lysimachia. And we need to stay current with um, the you know, scientifically accepted names for our species so that our knowledge stays contemporary. I know for all of us who've learned these things for years, uh, it's, a pro it's a headache, but think about the people who are 19, 20, 25 years old. They don't have that history of prior names and what, let's give them the names that they are gonna need to know going forward. The other thing that happened since 1973 is that there was the molecular revolution, that is DNA replaced morphology as the basis for doing taxonomy and systematics. And so this is a tree based on DNA uh, results. And basically what it's showing is what we call boragenaceae in the past, the borage family was actually in our flora, um, should be split up to include the heliotropiaceae, the aretiaceae and the cordiaceae. So this DNA revolution has resulted in a lot of changes and things that we are all very familiar with. In the first edition of the flora, we had Liliaceae. Liliaceae in the current version has been split up into about eight families. The same as with Scrofulariaceae, the figwort family. There's actually very little left in Scrofulariaceae. Most of it's now in Plantagenaceae. Um, so these are big changes. And again, we, we need to stay current with these changes. If we go down to the level of genus, just some, uh, some examples here in the first edition, there was Cryptantha. That's now been split into four different genera. Mimulus, the monkey flowers you might be familiar with, is now three different genera. So these are big changes. It took us a lot of time um, to work them into a new book. And, and just to give you a, an appreciation for the world that I was living in, in my work. This is the, these are the resources I have available to me. I identify plants every day I come into the office. And prior to this book, this is what I had available to, available to me. I had to rely on like five or six different books, Illustrated Flora of British Columbia, Manual of Plants of Montana, um, the Intermountain Flora, the Jepson Manual, Flora of Oregon, FNA. And if you look at the notes I've made here, they're either outdated, partially outdated books, or they are incomplete books. And so we just got tired of it. We thought, you know what, let's just revise the book. So we have one book where we come in and we can identify everything. So that's what we did. And it was an awesome project. We're so fortunate to have so much local botanical talent to draw upon. Uh, none of us are hot Hitchcock and Cronquist, but collectively, uh, we uh, equaled their task. And so this is a picture of people working in the herbarium. Some are doing revising treatments and some are doing botanical illustrations. And we were so fortunate through, I wish I had, if you remember the Washington Native Plant Society, there was an article about the primary illustrator, Crystal Shin in the most recent issue. Uh, Crystal did about a thousand new illustrations for the book. We had an undergraduate student working with us, Natsuko Porcino, who did over 200 illustrations. It was just wonderful to have so many people, particularly undergraduate students involved in the project. Um, Maria Yusufian and Sarah Legler, Maria's on the left, Sarah's on the right, Sarah's Ben's wife, did all of the layout work. It was just remarkable. We had a ton of contributors. 
who uh, wrote treatments in addition to Ben, Peter, and I, and then uh, we also had some additional illustrators. So it really was a community effort, a regional effort, people from throughout the Northwest, and even some of the contributors to the first edition, uh, the late Jim Reveal and um, uh, Noel Holmgren, uh, who were authors in the first edition, uh, returned and contributed to this here. So it was just great. Just to summarize the changes, just to get an appreciation for how different this book is. In the first edition, there were 129 families. Now there's 159. So essentially a 23% increase in the number of families treated. The number of native taxa that changed or were added uh, was 9.3. So not a lot. And some of those new taxa were just splits. This isn't, you know, um, 332 newly described taxa, probably a hundred of those were. So, but take a look at the increase of exotic taxa in the flora, a full hundred percent increase. So most of the changes between the first and second edition of the book came in the result from introduced taxa. And that really tells us a lot about the world that Hitchcock did his work in and the world that I do my work in. Um, it's there's a lot more disturbance and there are a lot more weeds and I don't mean to end on a downer note I don't see that situation changing unless some larger things change which as we all know are, are pretty difficult to make to make happen um, just so you know we when the book went to print we didn't stop updating uh, didn't stop the project we have a website uh, if you Google Floor of the Pacific Northwest Second Edition, it'll take you to this. And on that website, we have, um, oops, go back. Uh, we have found that there are some typos and there's some additional information that distribution information that we would like to make available. The most recent entry was added. I, I, I took this screenshot um, two years ago, but I have made changes on here within the last month. Um, so we have corrections to typos and distribution updates where necessary. And then we also have begun the process of updating the treatments to the book. So when it comes time to do a third edition, uh, I or uh, whoever <laughs> comes next doesn't have to start from scratch and we make these available as downloadable P PDFs. So for example, in the book, the maples were in the family Sapindaceae, but there have been some nice changes that allow us to put it back into Aceraceae. New, some species have been moved among genera. Um, new species from particular genera have been added to the flora. So, you know, we're trying to capture all that and make that information uh, available. At, and the best way for us to do it is through PDF. So you can download these new treatments and they indicate uh, in what way they've changed. So I just wanna finish by thanking all the people who uh, supported this project. Man, we had so much support uh, from federal, private, uh, individual donors. It was just wonderful. Um, I think there were over 200 individual uh, contributions that were made to the project and it really made it feel like it was a, a community effort. And with that, I will end my show and I would gladly answer any questions that anybody had about my presentation and so, David, the other things I didn't. First question I wanted to get after is obviously I'm impressed by two things. Obviously, the, the new edition of the book is just phenomenal, right? And I'm I'm enjoying reading it and just and and just immersing myself in it. But I contrast that, of course, with all the online tools. I mean, uh, the, uh, the, uh, and the online uh, keys, as well as the visuals you have there, what do you advise to students in terms of how to balance, you know, the use of the book versus the use of online resources? Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, the book is a great reference book for amateur botanists, let's just say. If you're an amateur botanist, and by that I mean you, you aren't paid um, to know the plants and, and paid to key identify plants. 
And by amateur, it's not a reflection of skill level. It's just oftentimes um, people who are amateurs don't have the background in the technical details and terminology vocabulary that's used in the book. And it can really be like this big wall. And I would say, that's fine. I can f- completely appreciate that, at that, but it the information in the book tells you what family things belong to, whether or not they're native or introduced, the habitat that they uh, occur in, um, the distribution. So it's really a reference book for many people. Now, obviously for me, it's a tool. The online material that I just showed you, like the Washington, uh, Plants of Washington Image Gallery, you know, that is far less technical and has much more explicit general information. Distribution, bloom time. We don't include bloom time in the flora. There just wasn't enough space. So that's nice. Being able to visualize the distributions is really helpful. Um, The downside of the online key that I showed you is that because it's tailored to a non-technical audience, you can end up with a lot of, a lot of ants like delphinium. There's 20 species of delphinium and the differences are very technical and you need a book like the flora to tease out those things. So if you get into delphinium, but don't know what it is, then the flora would be a great resource. It's really hard to do that from the online checklist and from the app that I showed. So it really depends on one's needs and level of detail. Does that answer the question? That's great. Perfect response here. I see a question here from PJ regarding any, are you doing any work in Alaska, you know, University of Alaska Fairbanks and their floor? Oh man, that's a great question. I would love to be doing um, work in uh, Alaska. I'm not, but the, um, the herbarium there, who I'm colleagues with, uh, Steffi Ickerbond, who's the curator there, they contribute information to the consortium. And so we use that information when we're doing range distributions, because um, uh, when I, I said species distributions, the range of species. So if I go back to, I'm gonna go back to my presentation here just quickly. Because you know that question is gonna come up as well, David, in terms of what are you seeing relative to species migration south well, to north? I hear you. And, you know, um, I would love to tell you. Yeah, Troy called me yesterday. I talked to him yesterday. And he he's not able to print out for some reason. He's in Las Vegas now. He can't print out the form. So he emailed. I think, I think someone needs to. Yeah, I got it. OK, um, so I just want to after for each species, there's a range statement. And I don't. Yeah. And so these range statements come from herbarium specimens and the information that we get from Alaska informs that part of the book. But the book itself isn't, some of the species occur in Alaska, but it wouldn't be a good resource for Alaska because we feel like its comprehensiveness ends at the Southern uh, Canadian border, British Columbia. But- Aaron, you have a question. You're on mute there. I don't have a question. No, okay. but Sharon, go lightly here. Where's your I've got face it. part? Yeah. Uh, I've got it. Uh, I want to know specifically what is the web address because I want to put it in a reference material for a plant clinic. Um, which, uh, which address would you like? Uh, whatever you have. Uh, okay, I'll, s- I'll send two. I'll send you right now. I'll s- put in the chat. Um, that's for the image collection. Okay. And then I will put the Flora project okay. website in there as well. Okay. Um, Can we publish that in our next newsletter? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, If John, you could put that in the newsletter. Yes, I'll do that. Super. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, I actually think that uh, the Image Gallery website is a great resource for gardening, right? 
because right. you, can, you can plug in the habitat. Let's say you have a wetland area and bloom time and whether you want a perennial, um, you know, it, I, I personally don't use it for that, that in that way, but I've often thought that it, it's a great way of figuring out which native plants yes. might grow in one's garden. See, there's the tip off for Terry, right? For our plant sale comes <laughs> July, right? Let's go native figure plants. out what plants are going to be blooming in July here, right? That's right. Because they sell the best. Yeah. yeah. And so actually a lot of nurseries contact us and ask us if they can use the images and the image gallery for, you know, putting up, you know, at a plant sale, people want to know what they look like when they're blooming, right? You can't just sell plants that are in flower. Um, and so people... The way the website works is you have to contact the photographer for permission, um, but that is one way that the information there is used. Ben Legler, who, as I mentioned, was my collaborator on the floor project and built that website, has about is the best images, and he makes them. If you ask him, he'll gladly let you use them for whatever educational purposes. Uh, Sabine, it says you got it. Uh, what? You're saying Amazon that uh, has cut a deal now. Suddenly, the price is the price in the book is a lot cheaper than it was a few weeks ago. Well, when I checked when I checked a few weeks ago, it was seventy five dollars, and I just went back to check because I was going to buy it and was hoping for it to go down. Today, it's fifty two. Oh, that's a good price. It's fifty two dollars, and I ordered it. And uh, when I think about there's so much information online, I ordered it just for enjoyment. I love looking at books like this and for information. Well, thank you for your kind words. And I have to say, as some, uh, you know, there are print, there are some instances which online does not improve on print. And for me, using a flora is one of them. There's all kinds of floras online. I just always use the print. It's just e much easier to navigate. You know, I like consulting online resources, but every day I use a hard copy book because <laughs> it's just the easiest. Yeah. Jude, you had a question. Yeah, I have a couple of questions, actually. I wonder if there had to be a certain number of specimens of a plant that you have collected. Like, did you have to have 20 of them or 40 of them before you entered it into, into the book? Are there any plants that you know have been found in this state that are not in that book? Yes. Okay. People have described new species since we published the book. It's just crazy. <laughs> in fact, a colleague, Peter Zika, who is, um, I, I showed you at the beginning, he is actually in the process of describing a new species of Luzula, um, the wood rush. And so I, to answer your question, for native species, we only need one specimen. But for not for because it's here, right? It's native. It needs to be accounted for, and and but for introduced species, there was a higher threshold, be, and that was there had to be clear evidence that it was naturalized, established uh. in in the wild. So it turns out that this was the most contentious part of the book. <laughs> what is established and what is wild and so i have colleagues who will go unnamed who think that if i go to the city park here and i find something in the lawn established that that should be in the book and you know that just you know a lawn isn't a wild area and um you know we just the book would have been so much bigger if we didn't have a higher threshold. So we needed a different threshold for introduced versus. The exception, of course, are noxious weeds. The goal of noxious weed control is having a minimum number of, po uh, of populations. So for example, kudzu is on Washington State's noxious weed list. I think it's only known historically, um, but because it's a noxious weed, we included it as well. Does that? Interesting. That's really uh, on the on the naturalized ones that you do have in in the book. Are you citing their origin? Yes. Where they are native? Yes. So and time of entry, known entry. No, we don't have that. That's a that's a harder one. That's a great. It, it'd be great to have that, and it it, it I, I wish I had the time to tell you about a project I'm interested. In. It relates to that, but 
we have it where it's native from. So we have a convention. There are a lot of abbreviations in the book. So introduced from, we just use the word INTRO and we'll say like Eurasian intro or European intro, Mediterranean, in, uh, Eastern North American intro. So yeah, we do indicate where it's native. And, and some of the things are native, like, so for example, a good, a good example of this is uh, California poppy. So in Washington, California poppy is introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, in Oregon, it's native. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason we know that is because when we go back into the herbarium records, the first collections of California poppy in Washington are from like the 20s or 30s. And those from Oregon are from the 1800s. I mean, you'd have, you, there were a lot of people looking at plants, believe it or not, in late 1800s, early 20th century. You couldn't have overlooked California poppy and they, they were along roadsides and things like that. So um, we, where, where possible, we do it, if the native and introduced ranges overlap or abut one another, we, we try to indicate that as well. Great. Other questions, uh, other comments. In fact, I want to make sure that, that we get a shout out here just for the Burke Museum overall. If you've not been up there and visited the Burke Museum recently, I encourage you to get up there. Um, it's a phenomenal experience, you know, the entire and and, uh, and it just it'll 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 it, um, the presentation of the material, the way it's laid out from an educational standpoint is truly inspiring and learning very much of a learning experience for us as master gardeners. I have a question. Uh, does it include uh, deciduous plants in, in wintertime? Uh, it, it was 45 years ago when I had the book, when I was studying botany, but uh, it, it didn't have it back then. Uh, you mean like a winter twig identification? Yes. It doesn't, but that's a great question because I, again, you know, I, I try to be sensitive to, to everybody's time, but um, on the plants, hopefully you can see the image gallery here. Yes. Okay, so we have a winter twig identification key here. And uh, we could say buds and leaves alternate, the bud tips are pointed, you see the same idea, the number of matches are going down, uh, the scales are imbricate, uh, let's say that they are glandular and then I hit show matches and then it gives me three choices. Let's go back to the Ribes bracteosum. And then if you scroll down among those images, you can see some very nice photos. These are Ben Legler's photos. You can see some very nice images of those winter buds. So even though it's not in the book, uh, it is available online, so I would encourage you, if you're so interested, to well, make make use of that. Yeah, a lot of our master gardeners like to explore and, and identify plants in the wintertime, and Master Gardening Program had a pamphlet for identifying uh, winter plants or deciduous plants, and... Uh, Gilkey, who Oregon State University had a winner. Right, yes. yes. I yeah. know, I think it's out of print or it's, it's hard to it get is. to. And I should say, I went to school in upstate New York. Uh, um, and <laughs> I took winter twig, I took like ornamental plant identification in the winter quarter. Uh, there's nothing, that's how we learned all the plants was by winter bud. Winter bud. And we, you know, we had to learn to identify like 250 species or something. So I'm totally on board with the value of winter uh, doing winter twig identification and the diagnostic characters for um, uh, uh, of winter buds. But I'll say, you know, just as a reminder that it doesn't include cultivated material unless the cultivated plants are escaped. So for example, uh, Scott's broom would be an example of something that was cultivated, it's established in the flora, it should be on there. But 
you know, other things that haven't escaped from gardens that are popular wouldn't be included. Sir, like our sweet cherries who are almost as thick in the woods as Scott's broom is along the freeway. Yeah. And right. they hybrid dies with our native uh, Prunus imaginata. I know it. Yeah, I know. We've got Peter Zika uh, described that, that, uh, that hybrid. Yeah, it's a problem all along the west west side of the Cascades. David, this has been phenomenal, and it um, you know I went uh, obviously it uh, you've given us a, a, a tremendous overview not just of the book obviously but the online resources which yeah. are incredibly extensive and incredibly more extensive than I think than I think we were all even generally aware. So I, I think you need to do a better job of promoting right what's online here. Yeah, it's tough, you know. Uh, I give a lot of talks and we try to promote these things, but you know, there's, there's a lot of information out there. And so um, it is a competitive information world. And I'm really, again, thank you so much for the chance to share what I do with you all. I'm really easy to get a hold of. I'll put my email here in the chat. If you have any questions about my the presentation, the material I covered, or, or other things you think I would be helpful, feel, feel free to send me an email. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, David, okay. for joining us here this morning. Thank you. Thank Thanks you a lot. Much. Have a good day. You bet. Bye bye. Take care. Wonderful. Thank you. Very good. So indeed, it is. It's a. Uh, it's really a big deal, right, for us to have had uh, David here today, and it, uh, I want to thank him and it uh, and make sure that folks, you know, have a chance to, to experience all this. Okay, so it, uh, a quick reminder here is that we're going to move into our board our board meeting here. I'm going to go ahead and it, 